just over everything that we're going through, over anything our nation's facing, any giants we're looking at, any fear, any virus. I just want to speak the word of the Lord over our situations. And the voice of the Lord reigns. It's above any flood. And so I just want to speak this over your families. I want to speak it over your businesses. I want to speak the word of the Lord over our nation of what's happening. So Psalm 29, it says, The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord splinters the cedars of Lebanon. He makes them also skip like a calf. The voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple, everyone says glory. The Lord sat enthroned at the flood. The Lord sits as king forever. So, Father, right now, just over everything going on in our nation and our city, our state, we just speak the voice of the Lord over everything right now. We think the voice of the Lord has the final say. It's the highest authority. And so, God, we let your voice speak right now to the nation, to our state, to our families. God, we say let your audible voice come to the leaders. God, we thank you that you spoke the world into existence. So nothing's too impossible for you, Lord. And so you you love to hear a David take down a Goliath, that even right now that you actually hear this prayer in Shell Beach, even for our nation, Lord, even right now. It says one puts a thousand to flight, but two puts 10,000. And so God, we just come into agreement here for the voice of the Lord to reign over every situation, every circumstance. 
over every fear. Yeah, God, we just thank you for the voice of the Lord reigning. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow. Okay, well, you guys can grab a seat. I'm just fired up. Whew. Thank you, Jesus. Give it up for the worship. That was amazing. Okay. I'm just passionate for God's voice. I just love that he's speaking today. He didn't just speak 2,000 years ago, but he's speaking tonight, right now, the voice of the Holy Spirit. And it says, give us this day our daily bread. So every day to hear what the Father is saying. And, you know, no matter what's going on, I want to be tuned in to what the Father is saying, what's on his heart. So that's good news. You know, we get to come here and hear the good news. I just, during worship, I just saw an angel walking in, and you, I, I just saw that it, you can't even see it's an angel, but it was really, it was really worshiping, and really, it was in the presence of God, and even though it was holy itself, it was still worshiping wow. whatever else was holier, it, and even though if you ha if you're, um, e even if you are a king, or you're super rich, or you're super famous, you should still take time to go and just worship God. Wow. I love that. That's cool. That is so, so good. Praise God. Every honorable thing falls down at the feet of Jesus. Wow. God gave me a verse during worship. It says this in Isaiah 32, 1. It says, see a king will reign in righteousness and rulers will rule with justice. And you know, it, it, uh, it, struck, it strikes my attention that in the church, when we are just learning to have faith and when we're learning to believe, some things like healing, like hit us, like healing, belief for healing, you know, and it's kind of a thing, it's like, wait, I can't really do that. And then as your faith grows, it's like, I am going to believe for healing. And then your faith grows and it's like, Jesus is the healer. You have, how many have ever had that progress? Maybe in different things. When, when uh, overcoming uh, sin or, or, or salvation is like, I know Jesus can save me. I know Jesus is saved. I am saved by the blood of Jesus. It's just a progression of faith. Well, I want to tell you, when we read this verse, see a king will reign in righteousness and rulers will rule with justice. If I were to say, Jesus is going to bring justice in our country, we'd be like, ooh, I don't know, because our faith is not, we've never been, we've never gone that direction with our faith. Maybe. Maybe some of you guys are, have been patriots for, you know, decades, and you're like, I know God's going to come through. But, but I believe the faith of the church is growing to the point where we can say he will bring justice. He said he was going, I am the healer. He came to bring healing. This is also true. He's a king who comes to bring justice. Equally the same. Those are equal things that he came to bring. It's part of the salvation of God to bring justice into the earth. Wow. And we need to start believing it. It's our faith that needs to start saying he is going to bring justice. It's like instead of, oh, you know, I guess we're going to have to wait for justice. Oh, I guess maybe justice isn't going to happen. Have we found ourselves doing that? I, mean, I guess maybe justice isn't going to happen this time around. I tell you what, our faith needs to be standing on the God of justice. Without wavering on the God of justice, he will be faithful. It is the exact same argument with healing as it is with what I'm saying here. And we need to just say, are we going to be believers? Are we going to be believers? That's the whole question. Or are we going to say, oh, well, you know, we can't just really believe in all those areas. Yes, we can, because he said, I am a God of justice. Whew. That's new. That's new for me. I've never seen that before. We need to start saying he is going to bring justice. He will bring justice. So praise God. Let's all, let's all grow in, that, in, the, in the faith of justice of God together. Right on? Okay, that's going to be a good thing. We, we believe in the justice of God. Hallelujah. Well, we're going we're gonna to gently open the Bible tonight, and we are gently going to lay out the word to us. Maybe I'll get a little excited. I don't know. I can't help myself sometimes. But I always try to start out very gently. 
And then I just lose everything sometime. So Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for, for life. We thank you so much for the truth. Jesus, more than anything, we want to stand on the solid rock and never move, Lord God, and never be moved. Lord, we stand on the truth. We stand on what you say. And Lord God, we will not move one second off one degree off of what you, where you've told us to stand. Your promises are yes and amen, Lord God. And we say that we are believers. We are believers. First and foremost, they call us believers. And so we are believers. We believe your word. Whatever you've said is true. Everything you said is true. And so we agree with that in Jesus' name. I want to talk about a life-changing uh, visit to a church I had First, I want to talk about a testimony that I, I just thought of when uh, earlier, uh, uh, when we visited a church when Tammy and I were new, newly married, and we went to a church in Fort Collins, downtown, and it was called Living Word Outreach Center, and the pastor's name was Mike Miller, and these people were cuckoo. They would just like, I mean, the, I don't even know who was leading worship, but they would come up front and they would just be speaking in tongues like crazy and they would be, God, we love you so much. Oh, it's like, it didn't, because we, I mean, we went, back then, a lot of the Baptist churches had the good preaching, you know, so we enjoyed going to the Baptist church. But man, I, it was crazy, right? It was like a little bit beyond. So afterward, I said, me and Tammy were talking, how'd you like it? And, uh, you know, I don't know. But I said this, because it was like, wow, it's kind of crazy. <laughs> Anybody uh, relate? A crazy church? Okay. I said to Tammy, if, if I knew God was coming back in an hour, I would go to that church because I know that they are accessing the throne of God. That it is their heart's desire to connect with God. That's where I want to be. I don't want to be hiding in a back room singing hymns. I want to be there, knocking on the door of heaven. I want to be in the middle of passionate people that are ready to see the Lord. <laughs> Whoa, yeah. And I'm like, why would you do anything else? If this is real, go for it. If it's a game, go find a game. Go find some little church game. I'm not going to waste my life or any of my time with any religious game because the days are evil. And the truth of God is worth living for, honey. Praise God. It's good. Uh oh. I got a little crazy <laughs> right, right off. So I'm going to talk about my life-changing visit to an irrelevant church. And this just happened a couple, few months back. Never been to this church before. It was the first time I've ever been to this church. It was in Colorado, so you guys don't know where I'm talking about. Absolutely do not know where I'm talking about. And we went to the church, and they, had all, they were all COVIDed up. They had their chairs, like chairs over there, chairs over there. You know, I mean, just a couple chairs. And then everyone was wearing a mask. And then the worship was great. Because we knew the guy leading worship, that's why we went there. And, uh, and then they preached. And it was Jesus is a teacher. Jesus the teacher. What does a teacher do? Teacher says things that you remember. Nice. Teacher has good mottos to say. Nice. So I'm sitting there in his, that kind of message. A message that you would hear in children's church, usually. And I said to myself, if I was a young person, I would realize that the church cannot Tell me the truth of what's going on out in the world. The church does not have the answer. It's not even relating to life. 
If I'm going to get real answers about what's going on in the world, I'm going to have to go elsewhere. This is what I thought the young people are going to conclude. Because there's nothing relevant going on inside the building. And I decided right then, if I am going to preach, I'm going to be as relevant and as truthful about real life issues. I'm not going to pretend it doesn't exist. I'm not going to pretend there's nothing to talk about because there is something to talk about. There is a way that we can live in this world. There is a way that we can stand and have faith in God. And resist the things that this world is pushing against us. There is a pattern that this world is trying to put on us. And we are transformed out of the pattern of this world by the renewing of the word of God. And this is our salvation. is that we hold on to the word and we stand on the truth. And we will not move. We will not move. So that changed my life. I'm going to speak the truth boldly. Acts 18, verse 9, here's a great verse. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. That's our goal. That is our mission. Listen, people, family, the, 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 the mission we have is to speak the word, is to speak the word. We carry the word. We speak it. Praise God. All right. Okay, I want to. When I preached December 27th, I preached about personal freedom. And I talked about how personal freedom and, uh, happens in our soul. And personal freedom happens when we let the, the Word of God, we let the Christ rule in our hearts. Some people think, some people think that personal freedom comes when we take one of the things of our soul, which is our will. And we elevate it up, and I talked about this on the 27th. We take our will and we elevate it up and we say, by the the power of my will, I will dominate and I will come, I will bring my salvation. And that's called in the Bible will worship. If you want to hear that message, go back to that message. It's a couple weeks back. It's will worship. And will worship is a tyranny of your soul because one of the things in your soul begins to rule over the other parts of your soul. And when I was thinking this week about that tyranny of your soul, I was thinking about national freedom and national tyranny. And I want, to make a, I want to make a comparison here. An enslaved heart is a heart under the rule of human willpower, and it's will worship. One part of the soul rules over the rest of the soul. But a free heart has every part, your mind, will, and emotions, under the rule of Christ. They're all under the rule of Christ. Colossians 3.15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. And so a free life is where all the members are under, the, under Christ, not one of the members exalted to the, to the higher level, right? An enslaved nation is where one person or people rule over the rest. And the leader is above the law that governs the rest of the people. You hearing me? This is a perfect analogy. A free nation is where everyone, even the leaders, are under the same rule of law. It's the law, not one or or some of the people. It's the law that's the highest authority. You ever heard this before? This is a a perfect analogy of, of how you rule a nation and how God rules our hearts. The only solution to tyranny is when a constitution rules over the people. A document that rules the people the way the Bible rules our soul. Oh boy, that is very good. It is a constitution that rules over the people. That gives gives peace and that gives equality. Otherwise, it's tyranny. Because one person rises up, they throw the constitution out, and they say whatever they want to. That's just like the slavery of the soul under will worship. I just straightened out your mind. (laughs) I just made you understand why the constitution. Nations have a constitution. But wicked leaders start to just manipulate the constitution until basically it's worthless. But a free people will have a constitution. And even the leaders say the constitution rules. That's freedom. 
<laughs> I saw a recent post, and it said this. I just found a document that says all of our restrictions have been lifted in America. It's pretty old, though. It's dated 1776. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. I'm going to say... I'm going to say one thing that is a truism, and it's going to make you say, huh, that's interesting. And then you can put it on the shelf if you want to. But I want you to think of this. If our military has undeniable proof that our election was changed by another country and agents of that country working in the USA, are you guys following me? If our military has undeniable proof of that, then they are obligated by their oath to the Constitution to take action. I don't know if you knew that or not. This is not like, should we, should we not? The question is, are they going to honor, their, will they honor their oath to the Constitution? And it shouldn't surprise us if they do. Because the entire freedom of America was because people said we have to honor the Constitution. Amen. Because anything else is tyranny. Because yes. I just showed you how anything else is tyranny. Wow. That makes us say, wow. Yes. Maybe this will be an interesting week. But I want you to know the very thing that made America free is people that were willing to sacrifice their life for a higher governing authority. Yes. This is what makes us martyrs. Yes. Same thing. We are willing to lay our life down for a higher governing authority. Jesus is king. Yes. Jesus is king. Yes. Jesus is king. Yes. And nobody else is king. We're going to pray for our leaders to stay loyal to the Constitution or to meet God. Or to meet God. <laughs> I believe that there are people that are going to fight, take action to hold the Constitution and make it, it's not, this isn't just the whims of people. Who can pay off who? It's going to be something else. I am never, ever going to stop fighting to defend that truism. Ever. I don't care who they speak words over. The, what I'm talking about, the truism of what freedom, the de definition of freedom, I'm never going to stop upholding that thing. It has to be the rule of law because that's what freedom means. All right, so this is, our, this is our part. This is our part, and this is what I really want to talk about tonight. So all that was just free. So, yeah, you can, you can take your offering back, but then from this part on, now you have to give your offering. I'm just kidding. <laughs> People always say, that part was just free, and I'm like, what do you mean free? Uh, all of it was free, right? <laughs> it's like, whatever. Okay, enough of that. So what is our part? I want to tell you what our part is because I really feel like there is a place that our heart can get that, that's either dangerous or, it can get, or bold, okay? We, must, we each must continue to move forward. We, we must continue to move forward. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. One thing I do, forgetting what's behind, straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. We have to continue to move forward. This moving forward, this moving forward is our demonstration of great faith. To move forward, to never retreat. And faith pleases God. We hear that in he Hebrews eleven six. 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. I want to tell you something. Shrinking back. And I'm going to talk about what shrinking back looks like in different areas of our life. Shrinking back is the opposite of faith. And shrinking back is a destroyer. Hebrews 10, 38. 
but my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. Why? Because he's not in faith. Faith pleases God. If he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. There is an attitude that we get in our emotions sometime where we just shrink back. We just shrink back. And the whole process of shrinking back is destruction. It is death. It is the opposite of faith. And so I just want to talk about how these things play out, how you can move forward in life or how you can shrink back. In ministry, when I was in youth ministry, there was one thing that I absolutely would never tolerate, and that is that the kids are running the youth group. And what you get when you have youth ministry is you get kids that are uh, too cool for school, and they, will, they are good at intimidating. They probably intimidate their parents, they intimidate uh, their teachers, and they intimidate the youth pastor, and the youth pastor ends up being intimidated. That is the, never go to that youth group. Because you need to find a man of God that can run the, the church. So I, I have personal experience with that. So that's why I use it as an example. If you can't relate, sorry. Sometimes we're intimidated by people. Humility and intimidation are opposites. If I'm a humble youth pastor, and, or if I'm a humble person, and some up, somebody comes up to me and says, you know what, I really didn't like that message, uh, you know, because there was a rich guy and he left the uh, service and he said he's never going to come back. Here's, here's, the, here's the kindergarten, or here's, the, here's a good response to that. Oh, yeah? <laughs> That's a good response. That's humility 101. And then after you're a pastor for a while, you realize that attitude never changes. You know, it's like, so what? Let the door hit you on the way out, you know, or don't let it hit you on the way out. Rodney Howard Brown, <laughs> you guys ever seen this guy? Oh, man. He, he, he'll say some crazy things, you know, la, 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 crazy, crazy stuff. People will get up, and they'll start walking out, and he'll say, oh, don't leave. I'll change. I'll change. Just mocks him. It's kind of nice. Rodney Howard Brown. He came to our church a couple times. Our pastor was like that. He would not change. He was a good, great pastor, very good pastor. He's like, I am going to say the word of God. I don't care if half my church leaves. And we had times where he let a lot of the, like we'd go through times of repentance and people were like, this is too hard. We don't want to be in a season of repentance. You know, why don't you just talk about happy, joy stuff? He's like, it's a season of repentance. And when God tells me to move on, I will. And he didn't move on. And people left. And other things like that, like spirit of God, like just a lot of issues, healing, speaking in tongues, uh, uh, disciplining children, a lot of things he'd get in trouble. And if he ever got pushed back, he would just stand there and just preach it on purpose. Just continue to do it because he felt like it was the truth of God. And he must stand on it and not be intimidated by people. Well, that's, that's humility 101. I call it humility because you're not caring about the opinions of people. There's a humility. I've learned that there's a humility 201. And that's where you say, you know what? That's, a, that's really good. I, I, we're we're going to have to pray for that. And, I, and, and, and I'm sorry that happened. And in your mind, you're saying, <laughs> but you don't say it out loud. And you don't let it affect anything you do, anything in your heart. Am I telling the truth, Tammy? Am I telling the truth? <laughs> Give me a, <laughs> ask my wife. No, because then, then you're nice, but you're still unmoved. Uh, that's, that's better humility. But if you can't get any humility, just go to 101. <laughs> and then after that, grow to 201, okay? Anyway, I don't know why I'm staying on that. Maybe some of you need that. So in, in ministry, you, you can tell if you're shrinking back from the people or if you're moving forward. You can tell. You can feel it. Spiritually speaking, uh, 
you can tell if you're moving forward or retreating spiritually. God, God was teaching us warfare. Tammy and I were in our second house. Tammy, you remember? You do you? You can ask my wife. She'll t- Have you ever had a pastor <laughs> say something that he, he, okay. I'm sorry, this is so off. No, no, I want to tell this. So you have a pastor and he says something like, you know what, I, you know, I shot a lion in my pajamas, you know, and, and if you don't believe me, you can ask my wife. It's like, well, now everything else you ever said is suspect. Because I, in, I mean, I was flat out believing that everything you were saying was true anyway. Why do you swear to, uh, in that one thing? Because, oh, whatever. It's like, I don't believe you anymore. Okay, so you can ask my wife. I really feel this way. Just ask her. Okay, I'm done with that. Um, so God was teaching us spiritual warfare. We were on Stony Pine Court in that house. And we had weird stuff happening. We had a leaders meeting. I, I may give this wrong, but you can ask my wife. It kind of happened this way. <laughs> there was a leader meeting happening. We were talking about spiritual things in the youth group and stuff like that. And two things happened at once. A wind came up, the, door, the front door slammed open, and a circuit blew in our house, and a l- lights went off at the same time. It's like, that's freaky. That's weird. And then you get this feeling that there's some, you know, I don't want to. So you're, you're in bed at night, and it's dark, and I don't want to go downstairs. I don't want to. I don't want to do that. God taught me. God taught me this, the, the principle of Occupy. The principle of Occupy is one of the most powerful spiritual weapons of warfare you can ever have, ever. So, so this kind of thing was happening, and it was like creepy. Ooh, I didn't want to do that. And so I feel that way one night. I go downstairs. I sit down in the chair in the, in the room that's creepy, and I say, I'm never going to leave this until you go this is my house not yours all I had to do was occupy if I have to do it two nights three nights doesn't matter you occupy and it's gone it works all you have to do is occupy because all the enemy is trying to get you to do is shrink back how far it doesn't matter just a little bit is victory for the enemy So how much occupying do you have to do? Not that much. You just have to move in. This isn't going to happen. I'm going into the closet. I'm turning the light on. And I'm staying there. And I'm rebuking every single thing in this closet. This is spiritual occupation. This is moving forward. The opposite is shrinking back. And you're losing your faith as you shrink back. You need to do this spiritually speaking. You need to do this spiritually. You need to occupy. You need to move into things that the enemy, you know you're being intimidated. Whether it's with a person or just a feeling, you're being intimidated and it's spiritual. And it affects your faith if you succumb to that and you step back. It affects your faith. You don't realize it, but it's destroying your faith. Wow. Socially, I think this is the easiest one to relate to. You can hide and avoid. Or you'd just be willing to be there. Be willing to meet. Anybody relate to what I'm saying? Uh, me. Sometime after church, I'll, I'll be sitting there going, you know what, I just want to go home. I mean, there's so many people. I mean, you're great. I love you all. But I just want to go home. And God, I remember I was saying that one time. I just want to go home after church, you know. I'm going to have a sandwich. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> and God said, simple words, be available. Do not do that. You just be available. You be available. That's all it took. I said, yes, sir. I'll be available. And you, and you make yourself available, and all of a sudden, you're loving what's happening. You're loving your life. Because of very, God meets you. So be willing to meet people. Be willing to put your hand out and say, hi, my name's Bob. Howard. Howard? You're a great guy. Look at this. I just met a, made a friend. Just be willing. So you get an idea of the, the way shrinking back can be in all kinds of areas of your life or moving forward. Don't shrink back. Do not shrink back. Do not shrink back. Even if it seems insignificant, every type of shrinking back feeds fear. 
Joshua 1, 9, have not I commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Shrinking back is always a direct attack against our faith. Here's where, here's where a lot of people are right now. And they're saying this, it sure feels like we're in the, last, in the days of darkness. It sure feels like, like, like in our nation we're in days of darkness, so I guess we lost. Did you know that, I'm going to say something political, so hold your ears. Did you know that since uh, the 6th, Trump's approval has gone up? Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy? Isn't that nuts? <laughs> That's just like, man. Wow. Okay, I'm done with the political stuff. You can take the earplugs out. But people are feeling like it sure feels like we're in days of darkness. So I guess we lost. I guess we lost. This is the normal. This is like believe in God that I'm healed. Believe in God. And then go into the doctor and get in a test. And it's like, oh, I thought it was going to be good. But I guess I lost. That's where we're at right now. I guess I lost. Hebrews 10.35, therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. We need to not throw away our confidence. Either God is going to bring justice, or he is not going to do what he said he's going to do. He's not a God of justice. Oh boy, these, these analogies between teaching healing and teaching justice... Just keep going. There, there is a brand new, it's a brand new wheel in my mind that's spinning on that. It's like the same things that say, oh, I guess he's not going to heal is the same thing. I guess he's not going to bring justice. I guess he's not going to, I don't see the victory yet. I want to say this. The phrase, I don't see the victory yet. That's the phrase. I don't see the victory yet, whether it's healing or national uh, justice. But that phrase can never be sufficient grounds to abandon faith. That phrase must never be grounds for you to abandon your faith. I'm going to tell you an illustration. Recently, within, within a year, within the last year, we read an article by somebody I really respected. And he was talking about why we can't believe in the imminent return of Jesus. And you guys know I preach that. And he's saying, here's why we can't believe in the imminent return of Jesus. One of his main lines of reasoning was, my dad preached it, and he never saw Jesus return, so I'm rejecting it. Are you getting that? The, the, the idea, I don't see the victory yet, so I'm dumping it, dumping the idea. That's insufficient. That is not how a believer does it. If you think about it, the apostles preached the imminent return of Jesus. The apostles. They didn't see it. Titus 2.12, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, this Bible writer is believing Jesus is going to appear imminently. Wow. The question is, is the Bible true? Yes. Then God wants us to continually expect his imminent return. Saying it hasn't happened yet is not godly. But wow, the sixth came and went. Saying just because it hasn't happened yet is not adequate means to throw your faith away. That the God of justice has abandoned us. I don't care what happens for the rest of the month. Justice is going to be served by a God who said, I am going to come and bring justice. Amen. Amen. Okay? And if we... Uh, if I'm just... I'm going to give you plan B as far as the only thing I can figure out in my head. If, if, if there's a puppet of China that gets installed and the whole thing goes to China and we're all subjects of China, the church is going to start glowing like the sun. We, it is because the end is near. 
by the way, is why. And to get the harvest that God loves to get the harvest. I believe he can wake up most of the sleepy church and save most of them. Just trying to slap them out of their sleep. That's what God's doing. But we're going to literally, I'm not talking figuratively, literally shine like the sun and begin to see miracles like the very first church did. It has to happen. It has to happen. And that's going to happen sooner if somebody gets inaugurated or whatever. Even then, God can boink. Because the God of justice is faithful. Cool with that? I am never going to lose faith. <laughs> me, and, me and Howard, we're never going to lose faith. Amen. We are going to persevere. We're going to keep the faith. We're going to not shrink back. We're going to keep moving forward. Hebrews 10.36, you need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you'll receive what he has promised. For in just a little very in, in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. Even if things get difficult, 1 Peter 4.12, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. Oh boy, that's a good verse. And that helps me too. Do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. We are not the first people that have lost our country. We're not the first group of people that had a really good country and then it just went to tyranny, full blast tyranny. I mean, maybe the church was asleep through that, but there were prayers too. Anyway, so don't think of something strange. But we are going to be, we're going to be ready for the fight, right? Remember, in the best Bible stories, victory seemed impossible. The best Bible stories... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's like, we're going to stand up, and the king is going to repent, and he's going to say, you guys can go free. Uh-oh. They stood up, and then the king puts them in chains, ties them up with ropes. Once we pray again, the king, he's going to see what bad thing he's done, and he's going to let us free. And he's like, make it hotter. And it's like, man, he's going to make it so hot. Then he's going to feel sorry for us. And he's going to set us free. <laughs> it never happened. They just got thrown all the way in. It's impossible. It was in, this story is impossible. Every story that's amazing, an amazing story of faith, is an impossible story. It's dark. It's hopeless. Daniel in the lion's den. Throw him into the lion's den. I mean, all the way in. So anyway, and so we say this, we say this, I've fought, I've done everything, all still seems hopeless, now what? So we've, we've fought, we've done everything, and all seems hopeless. We've done everything we can. What do we do now? Ephesians 6, 13, stand your ground. After you have done everything, stand. Whoa, that's a good verse. So if we've done everything, I've done everything. I don't know what else to do. I've done it, oh, there's one more thing to do, stand. Stand. We have two choices. There's only two choices. We stand in the light or we run into the darkness. We stand in the light or we run into the darkness. If you, can, if you guys can find what Kat Kerr said yesterday, it was five minutes, right? It was the most powerful thing I have ever seen. Ever seen. Instantly, I was emotional and it took me 10 minutes to recover from what she said and it was like the voice of God said will you just simply stand won't you stand are you going to either stand in the light or you're going to run to the darkness so stand do not lose faith do not lose hope wow it's powerful okay what I said times a million because the anointing it was God himself saying it Kat Kirk K-A-T K-E-R-R She's got pink hair. You'll know you're on the right spot. She's being interviewed by somebody, and it looks like an a interview. You know, it's got a bar on, on the bottom. So I don't know who it was. That was the most powerful thing, and it was from God. This is the message to the church. Won't you just stand? What, is this time to lose faith now? No, it's not time to lose faith. Here's the conclusion. 
I want to, I want to tell you, this is, this is what we need to do. We need to be willing. We need to be willing. The first step is that we're, our hearts are willing. This is the most important thing. Abraham is the highest example of this willingness to be used by God, to do whatever God said. Genesis 22, 10. Then he reached out his hand and he took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. He was willing. Are you willing to stand against all odds to stand? That's, what, that's what's important. See, Abraham didn't have to kill his son, but he's the father of our faith because he was willing to. You may not have to die for your faith, but you are a martyr because you're willing to. He's made us martyrs. The Holy Spirit comes on us and makes us martyrs, witnesses, to spread the gospel. You may not have to give it all up. Hello? But you're, if you're willing to, it's counted as faith. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because this is Abraham's example to us. I have a testimony. Me and Tammy, you can ask her. If you, just, if you think I'm lying, you just ask her. <laughs> we were going to move to Merced before we found this wonderful place. We were looking at houses. We thought we were called there to, to help start a church. And suddenly God said, no. No. I was like, what? Okay. We could see that it was going to be a church split. Absolutely was not going to work. After we, I mean, we had spent months there preaching and, and meeting the people. And suddenly there was a no. I felt like God said this to me. Listen to what he said to me. He said, I was answering prayers from that city for revival. And for you to be a real offer of revival to that city, you needed to actually be willing to go. And you were willing, well done. And I thought, wow. And of course, like Abraham, we are thrilled that that didn't happen. <laughs> because we get to be here. Just like Abraham, he's probably, his whole life is like, man, I'm so glad you're not dead. <laughs> And I'm so glad we're here and not there, but it's real. The willingness was real. We were going to move. We were going to buy a house. We were going to settle down. We were going to make it happen in Merced. And I felt like God said they prayed for revival, and this is the offer of revival. I wasn't the gatekeeper of the town, but I think we ran into the gatekeepers, and they said no. Anyway. Yes. So if God says preach boldly, we preach as boldly as we know how. If God tells me to fight, I fight. No question. If God says lay down your life, I lay down my life. So be it. Because Jesus is king. And the rule of Christ is God's kingdom in the earth. The rule of Christ in your heart is God's kingdom in the earth. And he said, your will be done. Let your kingdom come. <laughs> right on. And this is how his kingdom comes, is by surrendered souls, surrendered hearts to God. Amen. So let's stand up and let's pray. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Let's, let's, bow our head, or let's close our eyes. Praise God. Job 23.10 says this, when, he, when God has tested me, I will come forth as gold. My feet have closely followed his steps. I have kept to his way without turning aside. And so, Lord God, I pray over us. I pray that we would always move forward and never shrink back. In every area of our life, Lord God, we would be those people that move forward and not shrink back to destruction, Lord God. I pray you would set it in our hearts. Show us the ways that we can step forward and ways that we've been stepping back, Lord God, and give us the key to make the shift, to start standing our ground and moving forward so that we're not giving uh, territory to the enemy, Lord God. Show every one of us. I pray that we wouldn't be sacrificing our faith by shrinking back, but Lord God, we would be growing in our faith. We would be moving forward in our faith, taking kingdom, taking territory in Jesus' name, whatever that is. 
Lord God, in whatever area you're putting your finger on in our life, Lord God, we will not surrender anything to Satan. Instead, we move, Lord God, because Satan has taken territory illegally from us. It doesn't belong to him. And so we take it back in Jesus' name. I pray for any lost dreams or hopes or promises. I want you to... We, felt like God did this earlier in the in the worship time any promise he made to you any promise back in the years of of your dealings with God where he spoke to you I am saying you need to take that back and not let go and not forsake that promise that promise is real that is the word of God and you need to hold on to it and never ever let go of it never forsake it do not shrink back from that promise because there's power in that word to fulfill itself if you hold on to it in Jesus name so whatever they are once again God we hear you say yes and amen to the words over our life praise God second Corinthians 1 2 20 says no matter how many promises God has made they are yes in Christ and so we thank you for it in Jesus name amen amen